error. But it, nevertheless, I understand that there may be some moral issues that we can't come necessarily to a consensus. We may not necessarily be able to win the debate every time in terms of these public moral issues. But at least we can hope for is have a sober, uh, uh, pr productive, uh, at least, conversation about morality in, in the public realm. So we're thrust right into it as Americans. You probably recognize your, um, your Declaration of Independence, and everybody has some of the Declaration of Independence probably, but the part that we probably don't have memorized that says something to the effect that when in the courts of human events becomes necessary for one people to sever the political bonds with connect with another and assume among the powers of the earth separate with equal stations which the laws of nature and nature God entitle them a decent respect for the opinions of mankind required that they should give a reason which impelled them to the separation. Okay, everybody <laughs> Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Go out on a high note. Um, and then the part that we all have memorized is uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, they are empowered by their creator of certain elements rights and blah, blah, blah. So all these self-evident truths that stem from those. But some of the things to look at here that are particularly relevant is the idea of, oh, sorry, that little bit got a little bit off, but what that's supposed to say there is the laws of nature and nature's God. In other words, this beginning part of this declaration points to the fact that this, these self-evident truths are self-evident because they're based on the laws of nature and nature's God. Now, 99 times out of 10, as we say in Tupelo, uh, when somebody says something like the laws of nature, the first thing that comes to mind are going to be things like electricity and gravity and, uh, and these kind of things. And certainly the phrase laws of nature would include that. But I submit to you what the framers of the Declaration of Independence had more in mind when they were using this phrase in this context are not just physical laws of nature like gravity or electricity, but moral laws that are grounded in something real that are ultimately stemming from the way God is and the way God has created the world. And so that's what this is uh, all for. Now, I don't know if you recognize this gentleman here. Who recognizes him? Who is that? You have to pardon me a moment because my doctor told me I wasn't getting enough hydrogen in my diet. So I have to drink some water to replenish the hydrogen. I told the kids, they were saying, we're going to go jump in the pool. I said, be careful, it's got hydrogen in it, and we know how explosive that is. So, you know, just remember the Hindenburg. That's all I'm saying. But if you want to go swimming in the pool, kids, then by means. So, in your honor, talking about. Well, what he's talking about is something that already finds its origin in American discourse in the Declaration of Independence. That's what this laws of nature and nature's God are all about. Well, what is natural law? Let me give you the punchline, and then I'm going to come back at it and sort of sneak up on it and unpack it a little bit. But here's basically the thrust of what I want to communicate this morning, is that natural law theory, first of all, let me interrupt myself. Okay, that was me interrupting myself. Uh, I'm going to propose a theory of ethics, what is sometimes called meta-ethics, that not necessarily every Christian buys into to the same degree that I do, or wouldn't necessarily buy into some of the background philosophy that gives rise to it. That's fine. These are sort of family discussions. I think the punchline of it, though, most Christians with whom I'm familiar that do apologetics, would, we would be in agreement, and that's basically this, that moral truths are objective and true about reality. It's something true about reality in a way that's not dissimilar to physical laws. So we don't all have our own opinion about gravity, right? In fact, not only that, but if you've, if you've ever met an atheist who doesn't believe in that God exists, much less that he's a creator, then he, as an atheist, doesn't believe that God created gravity, right? Yet, because he doesn't believe God created gravity and doesn't understand that God created gravity, he doesn't float around on the basis of that, right? It's not like, there goes some guy and he's doing this, like this, and you go, oh, he must be an atheist. Why? Because he doesn't believe in God who created gravity, so he's just floating on. It's like, no, because gravity is part of reality. 
And granted, some people may not understand why there's gravity, that there's a God who made the physical world. Despite the fact that they deny that there's a God who made the gravity, gravity is real, and it affects people, even if they don't understand why there's gravity. I would submit to you that, in a very important sense, morality is exactly the same way in some important ways that I'll try to lobby for here in a moment. In other words, it's not the case that, well, if you're an atheist, then you, you, are, you just have nothing to say about morality that's humanly interesting at all. I go, no, that, that's, that's not only not true in terms of what we would like to think. We, we don't want to talk atheists into just being serial killers. If you're an atheist, you don't believe in God. Okay, well, you might as well just kill everybody. We, we wouldn't want that, obviously, right? We, but we would just try to argue and leverage an argument from morality to say, here's, here's why there's a God because of morality. But pending that, I still think that just as we can appeal to the atheist with respect to physical laws, even though he doesn't understand the creator who's the creator of the physical laws, that there is a level of moral knowledge that we can engage even atheists. Why? Well, that's actually our heritage, I think, as Westerners and even more narrowly as Americans. We don't have the luxury of time to wait for our neighbors to get saved before we have elections, right? So we, we, we want them to get saved, and we're trying our best to, to preach the gospel and, and, and lead them to Christ. But pending their faith, somehow we've got to be able to peacefully coexist with each other as citizens of this country. Whether you're a Christian or a Buddhist or a Muslim, whatever religion you are, are examples of that as, as we go along here. And I'm just going to, for the sake of time, uh, skip through some of these uh, slides, but what I would like to do, and I'll talk to the leadership here of the best way to do this, most of the time what I do when I do these kind of talks is I make a PDF of my PowerPoint and then I just put that up on the internet. So I'll give it to, to the leadership, actually they have this version, and, and, and that way you can download the PDF and get all the other slides we didn't talk about and those kind of things. But this idea that there is uh, some kind of objective moral reality that you can appeal to your fellow man and say, just as you can do that with the physical world, irrespective of their particular beliefs, you can do that to a certain degree with the moral realm. We see examples of that in history. Here are just three quick examples of this idea that there's some moral law that's real that even is greater than government itself, as our Declaration of Independence. These are the laws of nature, nature's God entitle us to these self-evident truths. So here are three quick examples. In Sophocles' play Antigone, Antigone's brothers both get killed. One of them dies in nobility in service of his country in the military. The other dies as a scoundrel. The king, outraged at this scoundrel brother, uh, gives the noble brother a suitable burial, and he leaves the other brother's corpse to just lie on top of the ground for the scavengers. Well, Antigone, the sister, is really disturbed by this. And so against the laws, quote-unquote, against the decree of the king, she sneaks out and goes and buries her ignoble brother because she figures, it's my brother. I'm not going to let him lie there and let the scavengers pick, pick his bones. Well, of course, she gets found out about this. She knew in advance that if she did this, she was taking a risk. Eventually, she gets in trouble before the king. But as she's standing before the king, her appeal basically was, look, this is just the right thing to do. There's something right about him deserving a burial as a human being. And that moral obligation that I have to bury him is greater than the decree of the king. That's kind of the punchline of the movie. Uh, in, with Antigone. Now, a more recent example were the Nuremberg trials in uh, Nazi Germany. And r realized that these were surviving Nazis who perpetrated these crimes during the, during the trial, I mean, during the war. And the justices were judges from Russia, the UK, France, and the United States. Those were the justices, okay? They're going to try this case. But they realized, well, wait a minute, the defendants, the Nazis, we can't try them on the basis of the laws of Russia, the UK, France, or the United States. Why? Because they weren't citizens of any of those countries. So you can't be tried for breaking a law of a, of a country that you're not a citizen of. So we can't try them on the basis of our own law. 
but they couldn't even try them on the basis of German law because Hitler made sure that what he was about to do in the Holocaust and other things was not illegal in Germany. He made sure the Constitution, he just unilaterally changed the law and the Constitution. So technically, everything they did, as atrocious as it seemed, was quote-unquote legal by German law. So what was the appeal then? To what could they appeal to hold these, uh, I want to be careful how I say this, but more or less trumped the civil laws of the time why? Because they violated something that was objectively true about the nature of human beings themselves. And so this idea of natural law is what this gets at. So what is natural about it? <sighs> dramatic pause. They teach you that in music education. You have dramatic pause. They're called rests in music. That's what they're called. Well, what's natural about natural law? When it comes to defining the word nature, in English, this word has several different types of usages, all of which are legitimate, by the way. I'm going to lobby for one of the uses, only because it's relevant for my topic here in these few minutes together. But, but understand, all of these uses of the word nature are perfectly legitimate. For example, sometimes people use the word nature as just a sort of catch-all term for the greater outdoors. Hey, we're going on a nature walk. You know, and let's get back to nature. And this is a natural kind of uh, 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 food supplement or whatever. It means it just kind of occurs on its own. It's not artificial. Okay, that's fine. But that's not really what the natural of natural law is referring to. Probably something that's more common to us as Christians, if you're here this, this afternoon as a Christian, uh, is, the, is how theologians use the term nature. And by and large, they, they say they use the term nature to refer to some particular aspect of our humanity. Oftentimes we talk about, say, like you've heard the expression, the sin nature. Like I just give you an example from a popular contemporary theologian, Wayne Grudem, where he says, in addition to the legal guilt that God imputes to us because of Adam's sin, we also inherit a sinful nature because of Adam's sin. I submit to you that both that catch-all term for the greater outdoors, and then this idea in the theological sense, they're both legitimate, but that's not the sense in which the philosophers use the term nature with respect to this idea of natural law. How are they using it? Okay, I actually pose for this monument here. Can you? That was, that was me one afternoon in graduate school, so this guy came and carved out a... I just made that up. No. Yeah, you, you wonder, you know, and you look at some just really, you know, robust-looking human being, and you say, yeah, I actually pose for this, and then everybody laughs. You go, okay, well, I must really, you know. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I pose for this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like you really look like some carved Greek god or whatever. Philosophers, though, use the term nature. Uh, sorry, sorry, that uh, font didn't carry through right with my PowerPoint. I need to get better at this. Uh, it, it has to do with that aspect of a thing that makes it the kind of thing that it is. It's a metaphysical constituent. Or you might have heard the word essence. So what philosophers, at least some philosophers, would say when they talk about a nature, a lot of them, what they mean, not all, but some, would say, well, what I mean is nature is a human nature, for example, is what makes you a human. Well, what makes this a horse? Well, it has a horse nature. Well, what makes that a tree? Well, it's got a tree nature. It's got an essence or nature, or, or maybe the other words you can think of. So that's the sense of natural law, because it has to do with human beings have natures, and because of that nature, that begins to give contour to what morality is, so that when we talk to the atheist, we have some objective ground to appeal to him to say, look, of course we, we regard humans more than we regard plants, because humans are a different kind of thing, even if he doesn't fully understand that ultimately humans are the kinds of things they are because of uh, the Creator, uh, the Creator God. So look at some bullet points about, uh, about nature and natural law. A nature or essence is a metaphysical constituent. Try to work that into a conversation. So honey, what did you do Saturday afternoon? Went to a conference. Well, what did you learn about? We learned about metaphysical constituents. Don't you talk that way. 
a metaphysical constituent of a thing in terms of which it is the kind of thing that it is. As a living thing, we're going to narrow our focus to living things, as a living thing grows and matures, it does so, if unimpeded, towards its proper end goal, or the Greek word is telos, or destiny. All right? Now watch where this goes. What a thing's end or goal or telos is, is determined by its nature. So you take an acorn, for example. Well, what happens to an acorn if it's unimpeded? What will just, quote, naturally happen to an acorn? Well, unless it's crushed underfoot or eaten by a squirrel, it becomes an oak tree. It doesn't become a whale, right? It's like, well, you know, but why doesn't it become a whale? Because some things become whales. Why not this? Well, because it's got a different kind of nature. And its nature determines its destiny physically by virtue of the kind of things it is. And so philosophers talk about this sort of trek on its destiny from an acorn to a fully grown oak tree. They call that progress sometimes. They call it actualizing its potentialities. So as an acorn, it has the potential to be a 70-something foot oak tree. And that potentiality just unfolds by virtue of the kind of nature that it is. So I submit to you that it's similar with human beings. So the natural and natural law refers to the fact that human beings are what they, I guess I could say we, are because we possess a human nature. A human being's end or goal or telos can be understood in terms of different aspects of our individual being. For example, we have a nutritive, we take in nutrients, we share that with plants and animals. They have nutrients. But we also have a sentient, that is, we have the senses we can see, see hear, taste, touch, and smell. We share that only with animals because plants don't have senses, so they're not sentient beings. But then we also have a rational where we can actually think in a way in which even animals can. It makes us unique among uh, life forms on, on earth. And to these three, by the way, Aristotelian categories, uh, Thomas Aquinas, as a Christian philosopher, recognized this additional eternal aspect of our reality as human beings, that we have some eternal goal and destiny towards which reign. And by the way, though this isn't the subject of my talk, just to let you know that I know this, it, uh, is a, quote, bad knife if it cannot cut well, since it is the perfection of a knife to have a sharp blade in accordance with the kind of thing it is. I mean, somebody gave you a knife for Christmas, and it was just real dull. You just go, this knife was really... This was not a very good knife. Why? Because you understand that by virtue of being a knife, a knife is the kind of thing that it ought to have a sharp blade, right? You wouldn't be upset if somebody gave you a spoon and it wasn't sharp. You're sitting there eating your Honey Nut Cheerios and your mouth is, you know, eviscerated and bleeding everywhere because you've got some razor sharp spoon, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't be upset that your spoon wasn't sharp, but you would be disappointed if your knife wasn't sharp because a knife quote, ought to have a sharp blade. Why? Because that's what knives are by virtue of the kind of thing it is. So by analogy then, uh, a human being uh, is a bad human being when he does not act well since it is the perfection of a human to have a virtuous character in accordance with the kind of thing that that human being is. Now, I hope you can already see at this stage that the, the ingredients are being set up so that we can appeal to our fellow human beings and our fellow citizens of a way that they ought to be just by virtue of being human, not by virtue of being a Christian. Of course, if they're a Christian, there's a lot of additional obligations and duties that come on, right? But what I'm lobbying for is it doesn't matter if they're atheists. We don't say to the atheist, oh, well, you don't believe in God, okay, you can murder. No, we say, no, you cannot murder. It's wrong to murder. Even if he doesn't understand why it's wrong, ultimately, because that's the way God made us and we have the natures because God gave us these natures. I'm saying, at, in the short end, we can appeal to him by virtue of an appeal to human nature, which he has because he's a human being, and I have, and you have. And so Thomas Jefferson called it common morality when he was writing about 
uh, how the system that we were setting up as Americans were, was going to function. And we realized well, we can't wait for everybody to be Christians because we have to appeal to them on the basis of common morality, common because it arises out of a common nature. Now, here's where the analogy, oh, sorry, here's where the analogy breaks down, or if you will, where the analogy serves me even better to draw a distinction. When the knife does not cut well, it's not a moral evil, since the knife doesn't choose to have a dull blade, right? So the analogy, a knife doesn't have a free will. It can't just wake up one day and go, you know, I'm tired of being a knife. I think I'll just be dull and just, you know, files itself dull, and it's just real rebellious and everything against knifedom. And just, you don't do that, right? It's not a moral thing. But with human beings, unique among sensible creatures, and what I mean by sensible is physical, because I'm trying to exclude angels and demons from this discussion because that gets us uh, into areas that aren't relevant. So unique among physical creatures on earth, human beings possess a free will and thus have the capacity to choose in defiance of our own telos. And that's what makes an action moral is when we do that. They're moral precisely because we're responsible for the actions that we perform that sculpt the kind of character that we ultimately grow into. Just as a nice political implications, because I started out with the Declaration of Independence, is a book titled Natural Law and Evangelical Political Thoughts, a bunch of articles. And, 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 and realize, you know, this idea of appealing to free will, I'm, I meant to say this a while ago, but I'll say it now that I'm reminded, it has nothing to do with the Calvinist-Arminian debate. If you're here and you're a Calvinist and you broke out in a rash when I use the word free will, first of all, the Westminster Confession of Faith talks about free will, so it's okay, all right? But what I'm suggesting to you is what I, the, how I'm using the term here is not really the theological debate about predestination and, and, and you know, Arminian. It's not that, as, as fun as that is. That's not, we're talking about free will in a philosophical sense that even Calvin himself would acknowledge uh, what is sometimes known in the literature as are secondary causes. If that, if that interests you, then you need therapy, basically. So, you know, if you're interested in that much philosophy, you need to take a pill, take a nap, it'll go away. Uh, this idea of natures, however, may be like, okay, well, this is kind of interesting. I'd like to pursue that. Here's, here's an interesting resource by a philosopher named David Oderberg called Real Essentialism. Who doesn't that sound like something you want to curl up with tonight? Honey, we were going to go out for dinner and go see a movie. <laughs> oh, no, I'm reading David Oderberg's Real Essentialism. You know, just leave me alone, buddy. I'm going to curl up with this book. Can't wait to rush out to the bookstore. Right? Some of you right now are ordering it. Same-day delivery on Amazon. You can't wait to get it. <laughs> what David Oderberg's doing in this book, and this is for those of you who are, have a special interest perhaps in philosophy, is that he's trying to lobby for the viability of this concept there is, that there are such things as natures or essences. Because for better or for worse, that concept has fallen out of um, favor in a lot of contemporary philosophical thinking. Doesn't mean it's false, doesn't mean it's true. I'm just saying it's another voice in the conversation that every opportunity I get, I like to just interject it and go, by the way, this is our heritage as Americans. We grow out of a natural law theory, and that's what governed political discourse for um, almost uh, to past the Civil War. Um, and, and, and there's a lot more to say about that. Now, What's the cash value of some of this? The, the reason why I bring this up, if it isn't obvious already, is drawing a distinction between biblical morality and morality. What's going on here? Well, the short version of it is this. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm born and reared in, in Mississippi. I live in Atlanta now, but I'm, a, I'm a, still a Mississippian by heart. Born in Jackson, grew up in Tupelo. Uh, my father graduated Ole Miss. I got my master's degree at Ole Miss. Uh, we're, even though we're a divided family in my extended family, but we're still got a strong contingency of Ole Miss uh, people. And one of the things that happened to me in Tupelo back in the 70s, if you're old enough to remember the late 70s, or some of you, if you were sentient during the 70s, some of you like, I'm old enough to remember, but I still don't remember the 70s. You know, well, we won't get into that right now. Um, but during the late 70s, there were several... Uh, sweeping political events that went on in America that was that generated what very soon afterwards became known as the religious right. You may even hear that expression sometimes. So was Ed McAteer, the Religious Roundtable, early James Robinson, um, and, and, and they and, and, and you know it was just this really strong 
intersection of conservative evangelical Christian thinking and conservative what it is because God has made the world the way it is and because of the way God is. That's all fine. I'm talking about the conversation with our fellow human beings. So you think of something like, uh, we have obligations that come out of our Bible, like, pick one example, uh, to be baptized. Or to pick another example, to observe the Lord's Supper. And, and we realize as Christians, these are things that we are duty-bound to participate in. And so it, you become a Christian, and then you follow Christ in baptism, in this public testimony. Okay, that's fine. You observe the Lord's Supper, however often your, your tradition uh, uh, observes that. But none of us would ever, hopefully now, None of us would ever expect our lost neighbor to be baptized and observe the Lord's Supper, would we? We would never require that of them because we realize they're not Christians. These obligations don't apply to them, and we're comfortable with that. We want them to be Christians, but pending their salvation, we don't, we don't go, I can't believe it. my neighbor's never been baptized, my atheist neighbor. Shame on him. We'd go, no. But why not? Because it doesn't apply to them because they're not part of the body of Christ, right? But we don't do that about things like murder. But isn't murder in, prohibited in the Bible? Yeah. So the question to ask yourself is, well, how can we expect our atheist neighbor to not murder while not expecting our atheist neighbor to not be baptized or expecting him to not be baptized? What makes the difference? That difference there, among other things, it has everything to do with this idea of natural law. Namely, that the morality of our of the behavior of individual humans arises out of the fact that you're human. Not that you're Christian human, but that you're human. That's where it's grounded. That's why it's a common morality, and that's why I think we can have uh, expectations that our neighbor uh, behave, and even our fellow citizens. Now, if you study natural law in terms of uh, some of its context, you will discover that it's nested in other concepts of law eternal law, divine law, human law, and it's a, very interesting, it's a very interesting investigation to see, well, how does natural law fit? What is eternal law? What is human law? What is divine law? What are these things? Those are interesting, but I'll leave that up to you to do your own investigation and go, how does that, how does that fit? But let me just finish with this idea uh, about the relationship of natural law to the scriptures. Um, what about, what, what does the Bible say? Well, there's some interesting verses that come to mind. Look at this out of Deuteronomy 9. It's not because of your righteousness God talking to Israel. It's not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart that you go in to possess their land. That's the pagans who were possessing the holy land. But because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord your God drives them out from before you. The question you should ask yourself is, biblically speaking, well, how could God expect these pagan nations to behave themselves? And why is he holding them accountable morally when they're not even the recipients of the law of Moses? How are they supposed to know that they are supposed to behave a certain way? I think it's hinting at exactly what later on the philosophers call natural law, that there's some morality that arises out of just being a human being that every human being is responsible for and God holds them accountable for. And so he's driving these nations out and giving Israel the land, not because Israel was real special. The Old Testament, or in the Bible, is a good thing. Today we talk about rain. It's a metaphor for gloom. It's like, well, you know, I'm having a rainy day. Hey, if you live in an agrarian culture and your very livelihood depends on the fact that your crops are going to get watered, when it rains, that's a blessing. And that's what that metaphor is. When it talks about the rain falls on the just and the unjust, it isn't, well, everybody has a bad day sometimes. No, it's like everybody has a good day sometimes because of the uh, systemic grace of God. And last, and this is probably the most direct biblical hook into natural law theory, uh, for when you Gentiles who did not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law. What's the work of the law? Well, the work of the law is the, is the obligations that the law brings. So you may not have the written law of Moses, but you have the obligations that that written law has, even if you didn't have that written law, because it's in the heart. It's written in the heart. They're conscious also bearing witness in between themselves, their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. So this idea that there is some kind of obligation of morality that stems from just the nature of human beings on which it gives us this 
this uh, duty to behave ourselves becomes the basis historically as well as I think in principle for having a cohesive society. Thank you. Questions, comments, humorous anecdotes, <laughs> balloon animals. I'll take anything. Yes, Pastor. Uh, I think that what you'll find very often is that uh, atheists, and, and actually a lot of people that aren't even necessarily lobbying for an atheism, have, um, they try to conduct these things without any reference to the concept of there being a nature, a human nature. So what I, what I think the argument has to do is try to show that, well, if you don't think that things have nature, if you don't think the difference between a human and a tree has something to do with something metaphysical, I think you can show them how that ultimately becomes self-refuting. A great resource, by the way, I didn't put it up on the slides, but it's a book called The Last Superstition by a philosopher named Edward Faser. It looks like Fesser, F-E-S-E-R, but it's pronounced Faser with an, like a laser with an F. And what, what Ed Faser does in his book, he's specifically targeting the new atheism, the Richard Dawkins.